Hello everyone, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kalen Ashcroft. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ages of Empires, where we will be going through all of the major world empires throughout history. In this episode, we will be covering the Ayyubid Dynasty and the Latin Empire. As well, from each empire, we will highlight a specific leader. So from the Ayyubid Dynasty, we will highlight Saladin. And from the Latin Empire, we will highlight Baldwin. So two very important leaders, particularly Saladin, was one of the first historical leaders I learned about and really inspired my interest in history. I've learned about many more leaders since. However, he still sort of remains a, an important place, perhaps, in my influence in my influences and still today is an influence of mine. So I hope you enjoy. And at the very end, we'll have a comparison between Saladin and Baldwin as well in the style of Plutarch's Parallel Lives to learn a bit more about both of them and hopefully about both of their respective empires as well. So without further ado, we will start with the first empire and leader. So the Ayyubid dynasty was a significant Islamic dynasty that emerged in the 12th century CE common era founded by Saladin, or Salah ad-Din Yusuf ibn Ayyub, hence the name Ayyubid dynasty, so it comes from Saladin's name, in fact. And it was a Kurdish military, who was a Kurdish military leader, who rose to prominence during the Crusades period. So both of these empires that we will be highlighting today fit in with the Crusades, so hopefully we'll see some parallels here. The dynasty played a crucial role in the history of the Middle East, particularly in the Levant region and Egypt as well. Its base, in fact, was in Egypt. Therefore, we seek to find history of both of its rise and fall to see reasons why it might have succeeded and reasons why it might have failed. So for some further background information, however, first, so the Ayyubid dynasty, also known as the Ayyubid Sultanate, was the founding dynasty of the medieval Sultanate of Egypt, established by Saladin in 1171 CE following his abolition of the Fatimid Caliphate in, of Egypt. So we have covered the Fatimid Caliphate of Egypt, which was a Shia Islamic state. So this is, however, the Ayyubid dynasty is a Sunni Muslim state of Kurdish origin, hence Saladin was Kurdish. Saladin had originally served the Zengid ruler, or Zengid ruler, Nur ad-Din, who was leading Nur ad-Din's army in a battle against the Crusades in Fatimid in Fatimid Egypt, so he had fought against the Fatimids previously, where he was made vizier as well, so he sort of rose in the, the hierarchy. We'll highlight this more in more detail, however. Following Nur ad-Din's death, Saladin was proclaimed as the first sultan of Egypt by the Abbasid Caliphate, so we also have highlighted the Abbasid Caliphate, which is tied with the Umayyad Caliphate, which preceded it as the seventh largest empires of all time. So, it's, so the, the Ayyubid dynasty, however, sub started subordinate to the Ayyubid, the uh, pardon me, the Abbasid Caliphate. We also have the Iranian Intermezzo period episode as well, where we can highlight some other important dynasties and empires that were subordinate to the Abbasid Caliphate. However, the Ayyubid dynasty, at least during the period between 1171 to 1260, was relatively autonomous and rapidly new sultanate on the frontiers of Egypt to the territories of Nur ad-Din, belonging in addition to Hijaz, Yemen, and northern Nubia, Tarabulis, Cyrenicia, and southern Anatolia, and northern Iraq, the homeland of the Kurdish family as well, so he expanded perhaps back into his own territories. By virtue of his sultanate, including Hijaz, the location of the Islamic holy cities Mecca and Medina, he was the first ruler hailed the custodian of the two holy mosques, a title that would be held by all subsequent sultans in Egypt until the Ottoman camp conquest in 1517 CE. So the first Islamic leader, or first leader at all, to hold both the two most important Islamic sites. Um, that being Mecca and Medina, the third would be Jerusalem. Saladin's military campaigns in the first decades of his rule aimed at uniting various Arab and Muslim states in the region against the Crusaders and set against the borders of a sphere of influence for the Sultanate of Egypt. So expand the sphere from Egypt outwards as well, from almost three and for almost three hundred three and a half centuries of its existence, so it lasted long after Saladin, as we shall see. Most of the Crusader states, which one of which we will highlight, including the Kingdom of Jerusalem, fell to Saladin after his victory in the Battle of Hittin in 1187 CE. However, the Crusaders reconquered the coast of Palestine in 1100, 
1890s CE, but we'll get to all that later. That was just a very quick and broad overview. So, starting with the rise of the Ayyubid dynasty, starting in the late 12th century. So the formation under Saladin from 1137 to 1193 CE. So Saladin was born in Tikrit, which is in modern-day Iraq. Be and he began his military career under the Zengrid dynasty, a dynasty we have not highlighted specifically because it is not large enough and was also entire subordinate to the Abbasid Caliphate, serving the Kurdish ruler Nur ad-Din. So sort of maybe a mentor of his was Nur ad-Din. After Nur, after Nur ad-Din's death in 1174, Saladin seized the opportunity to establish his own power base in Egypt, eventually overthrowing the Fatimid Caliphate in 1171 and founding the Ayyubid Sultanate in Egypt, so overthrowing the previous Fatimid Caliphate and also changing the religion as well from Shia to Sunni in the region, but starting from Egypt. Although it must be important to note that Saladin himself was born in Iraq. As for his consolidation of power, so Saladin's military prowess and diplomatic skills combined allowed him to exert his influence beyond Egypt. He conquered various territories in the Levant, including Aleppo, Damascus, and other crusader-held cities, effectively uniting much of the Muslim world under his rule. So very uh, significant conqueror and quite a warlord, in fact, but also knew how to use diplomacy, but most of the time his diplomacy was reliant on his power in arms. As for his crusades and conflict with the crusader states, the Ayyubid dynasty became a formidable opponent to the crusader states established by the European Christian knights in the Levant. So these Europeans start coming down back into Europe to try to take over the promised or the holy lands. And the, the Ayyubid Caliphate was one to uh, fend them off in many cases. For example, notably the Battle of Hittin in 1187 led to the recapture of Jerusalem from the Crusaders, though the city would later change hands multiple times. But however, so the Ayyubid Caliphate would take Jerusalem from the Crusaders at least at that point in uh, the Battle of Hittin in 1187 CE. As for its zenith of power and influence in the late 12th and early 13th century, so as for its cultural and intellectual flourishing during this time, under Saladin and his successors, the Ayyubid Sultanate witnessed a period of cultural and intellectual prosperity. The dynasty patronized scholars, poets, and art architects, fostering a vibrant intellectual atmosphere and cities like Cairo and Damascus. Many of the remnants during this period still exist in both areas, cities. And, and areas as well. As for its expansion and governance, Saladin's descendants continued to expand the Ayyubid territories, extending their rule into Mesopotamia, Yemen, and parts of Anatolia. However, maintaining control over such a vast and diverse empire proved challenging, leading to internal conflicts and fragmentations. As for its diplomatic relations, the Ayyubids maintained diplomatic relations with various powers in the region, including the Byzantine Empire, a very large empire we have previously covered, Cru Crusader states and other Muslim dynasties as well, including the Abbasid Caliphate. These alliances and treaties were often shifted depending on the geopolitical landscape. As for decline and fragmentation, so the fall, perhaps beginning in the mid-13th century CE, starting with succession struggles. So, Internal conflicts over succession plagued the Ayyubid dynasty, leading to power struggles among the Saladin's descendants and rival factions within the ruling elite. These struggles weakened the central authority and contributed to the eventual fragmentation of the empire. It seems almost like some of our earlier Islamic empires, a lot of them were succession disputes, so even within some of these descendants of some of the earlier Islamic empires, there were still succession disputes as well. So seems to be a common theme throughout uh, many empires, not just within this region, but across the globe. In succession disputes as being one of the leading internal causes, if not the leading cause of the decline of many empires thus far. As for Mongol invasion, so as for also a very menacing force, and we're getting very close to the Mongol Empire, which has taken out many of the empires that we've already covered 
previously. So the Mongol invasions in the 13th century posed a significant threat to the Ayyubid Sultanate. Mongol forces led by Hal Halagu Khan, um, descendant of Genghis Khan, sacked numerous cities in the Middle East, including Baghdad, in 1258. Although the Ayyubids managed to repel some Mongol incursions, the invasions destabilized the region and further weakened their authority. So a very large threat, then even at a significant distance from the perhaps centrality of the Mongol threat. Further to external threats, in addition to the Mongol incursions, the Ayyubids faced further external pressures from emerging powers such as the Mamluks in Egypt, another famous empire, the Mamluks, and the rising Ottoman Empire, a very important empire we also covered. These regional rivals contested the Ayyubid territories and eventually supplanted the dynasty as the dominant force in the Middle East. So both the Mamluks in Egypt and later the Ottoman Empire would supplant the Ayyubid Caliphate or Ayyubid, pardon me, Sultanate, not Caliphate, Ayyubid Sultanate, or Dynasty. As for further to the Mamluk rise to power, the Mamluks originally s began as slave soldiers in the Ayyubid army, so that's a very fascinating way to that they would come to rule. The Mamluks originally were slave soldiers under the Ayyubid dynasty, and they seized power in Egypt in 1250, effectively ending the Ayyubid rule in the region. So at this, a slave revolt at the grandest scale, far far grander than perhaps the, the Spartans, Spartacus, for example, in uh, Rome. The Mamluks established their own sultanate, known as the Bari Mamluk Sultanate, and became a new dominant force in the Levant. It's a very fascinating course of events that we've not seen thus far in history. As for the final years, by the late 13th century, the Ayyubid dynasty had fragmented into several smaller principalities, each vying for power amid ex external threats and internal discord. So, very fragmented state at this point. The remnants of the dynasty gradually faded into obscurity as the other powers rose to prominence in the region. The fact that it was a slave revolt that ultimately took power shows to perhaps much of the internal instability. So thus, the Ayyubid dynasty left a lasting impact on the Middle East, particularly through Saladin's reputation as a chivalrous and honorable ruler through, and his role and reconquest of Jerusalem, perhaps one of the grandest achievements perhaps in all of history. Despite its eventual decline, the dynasty's cultural and intellectual contributions endure in, and in the historical and ar architecture, architectural heritage of the region. So, I also say architecture is sort of the epitome of art, so once we can build the foundation, one can then start to be creative. So, a very, very fascinating, important empire. Um, empire. I think there's a great movie, Kingdom of Heaven, which sort of you get to see great sort of conquest of Jerusalem by Saladin, so you get to see very few scenes by him, but it was very uh, an inspiring movie to me as well, and I thought really very well done by Ridley Scott. So as to highlight uh, more about Saladin, the very influential leader and inspiring leader as well of the Ayyubid dynasty. Saladin, also known as Salah Adin Yusuf, Yusuf ibn Ayyub, so Ayyub, Ayyub dynasty, was a prominent milit Muslim military leader and statesman in the 12th century, renowned for his role in the Crusades and for establishing the Ayyubid dynasty. Therefore, we, we seek to find a biography of his life. So. First, for some further background information, so Salah Adin Yusuf Ayyub was born around 1137 to the 4th of March, 1193. He's commonly known as Saladin, was the founder of the Ayyubid dynasty. Hailing from a Kurdish family, he was the first sultan of both Egypt and Syria. So an important achievement. An important figure in the Third Crusade, he spearheaded the Muslim military effort against the Crusader states in the Levant. At the height of his power, the Ayyubid realm spanned Egypt, Syria, Upper Mesopotamia, the Hejaz, Yemen, and Nubia. As for his early life and background, it appears 1137 to 1169 CE, starting with his birth and origins, Saladin was born in 1137 in Tikrit, a city located in present-day Iraq. He hailed from a Kurdish Sunni Muslim family, of the Rawadia tribe, Rawadia tribe, his father Najim Adin Ayub was a military commander and 
in the service of the Zengrid ruler, Imad Adin Zengi. So his father was a military camp leader, commander, so he perhaps learned a lot of his, or was even inspired by his father to follow a military path, eventually perhaps succeeding him. But nonetheless, he came from a Kurdish family in Iraq, which is perhaps distant from Egypt, where he would later rule from, and also from Kurdish, where, which is relatively a minority. As for his education and upbringing, Saladin received a traditional Islamic education in subjects like Quranic studies, jurisprudence, and military tactics. He also learned the art of warfare and chivalry from his father and older brothers, immersing himself amid the martial culture of the time. That's important to note that his sort of his chivalry was gained from having many older brothers. I think that I, seems to be an observance. One, males who tend to have older brothers seem to be well developed because seeing so many males they can kind of pick and choose sort of the best ways to act if they're sort of practical so it seems to perhaps be maybe one hypothesis for Saladin's chivalry and at least in the movie Kingdom of Heaven he's certainly quite chivalrous and he Saladin joined the um, under the service of Nur ad-Din his military service began in his early years where he joined the military service directly under Nur ad-Din the ruler of Aleppo and Damascus, who sought to unify Muslim territories against the Crusader states in the Levant, so a sort of enterprising leader that he joined the ranks of early on in his life, perhaps inspired by his father being a commander himself. Saladin quickly distinguished himself as a capable and loyal commander within Nur ad Din's army, so he became a coming commander as well as his father was, so following the profession of his father. As for his own rise to power, however, from 1169 to 1174 CE, as for his conquest of Egypt, in 1169, Saladin led a successful campaign into Egypt on behalf of the Zengids, aiming to, equal, to quell internal strife and assert Zengid authority in the region, so fighting on behalf of the Zengid authority at this time. However, Saladin's ambitious ambitions extended beyond the region and beyond the initial mandate, and he soon maneuvered to establish his own power base in Egypt. So he sort of betrays perhaps his, his leader, or he betrays his master, and sort of wants to create his own enterprise, start to create his own empire. However, Saladin's ambitions overrode perhaps maybe his, his rules, or perhaps overrode his, his uh, perhaps even the law perhaps. As for his overthrow, and that's sort of maybe perhaps the crime and punishment story where the protagonist Raskolnikov says, why is Napoleon different from the normal person is that Napoleon is allowed to kill and allowed to create his own destiny, whereas everyone else is sort of a subordinate, whereas Saladin seems to be a figure where he began sort of a subordinate, but he took the path of Napoleon many years before and sort of did not follow rules and killed and was justified. That's another thing that Raskolnikov says Napoleon was justified if he killed anyone else kills, it's considered a crime. And so Saladin was able to, to kill for his own ambitions, and it was seen as justified, and that's perhaps part of populism as well. Saladin, therefore, uh, taking advantage of the internal discord and the decline of the Fatimid Caliphate, Saladin orchestrated a bloodless coup in 1171, so he did it bloodlessly too, effectively ended, ending the Fatimid rule and proclaiming allegiance to the Abbasid Caliphate in Bang in Baghdad. So by creating an alliance with the Abbasid Caliphate, he managed to make create a, a coup and come to power without blood. So and the must be noted the Abbasid Caliphate is Sunni, whereas the Fatimid Caliphate was Shia. So through perhaps a religious tie, he was able to connect himself with a more powerful figure, the Abbasid Caliphate. This marked the foundation of the Ayyubid Sultanate in Egypt, with Saladin as the de facto ruler. As for his consolidation of power and achievements from 1174 to 1193 CE, it's for the unification of Muslim territories, Saladin embarked on a series of military campaigns aimed at consolidating Muslim territories in the Levant. So he didn't stop his ambitions there. Once he had the territory, he wanted to consolidate further, a unifier. He captured key cities such as Aleppo, Damascus, and Mosul, effectively unifying much of the regions under the Ayyubid rule, so uh, quite a, a conqueror as well. As for his crusades and the reconquest of Jerusalem, Saladin's most famous military campaign, campaign, campaign 
came during the Third Crusade in 1187 CE. He achieved a decisive victory against the Crusader forces at the Battle of Hittim, leading to the subsequent capture of Jerusalem, so the famous Kingdom of Heaven story, where the taking of Jerusalem by Saladin and the Ayyubid dynasty. Despite the br brutality of the medieval warfare, Salad Saladin's conduct during the conquest earned him a reputation for chivalry and magnanimity. So despite being the victor, he was sort of respectful to those he, uh, that he vanquished. And despite the religious differences and the cultural differences as well. As for his diplomacy and statesmanship, Saladin's rule was not solely defined by military conquests. He demonstrated adept diplomatic skills, negotiations, alliances, and treaties with both Muslim crusader powers. His governance emphasized justice, religious tolerance, and patronage of scholars and artists, contributing to the flourishing cultural and intellectual atmosphere of the Ayyubid, of the Ayyubid territories. So perhaps a take on Saladin and Kingdom of Heaven at the very end, there's a scene that was stuck, sticks with, stuck, stuck with me very profoundly and also another friend, he goes and said, why is, what, to, to what do you does Jerusalem mean? And he says, nothing. Then he walks off into the distance, then he turns around and says everything. And perhaps it's that he wasn't trying to kill off Christians, he wasn't trying to kill off different peoples. He was just sort of uh, aimless, just um, an ambition. Just It was the, the ambition itself, it wasn't the people that he was trying to defeat. So that's perhaps one take. And that seems to be, so once he took it, he was uh, respectful to the people that he ruled over. He was sort of the... It was the, the achievement he wanted, but not necessarily the power, of, or not necessarily to abuse it. As for his legacy and death, however, from in 1193 CE, as for his enduring reputation, Saladin's legacy transcends his military exploits. That's a, certain, that's a true statement, and particularly even within my own life. He is revered in both Western and Islamic sources as a paragon of chivalry, piety, and leadership. His character and deeds have been romanticized in literature, art, and popular culture over the centuries. As for, success, as for succession and successors, Saladin's death in 1193 marked the end of an era. He was succeeded by his sons who struggled to maintain the unity and stability of the Ayyubid dynasty, or Sultanate. So although it lasted many years after him, it was never really as great as it was unified as unified as it was under him its zenith would perhaps come later but it was so succession disputes would be played throughout its history at least through varying degrees and through intervals but nonetheless it was if perhaps if there was a success if saladin could have ruled it infinitely perhaps it might have lasted infinitely hypothetically but probably not but perhaps so uh further Furthermore, but Saladin's name remains synonymous with the defense of the Muslim lands and the, the ideals of honor and nobility. Despite that, the world would eventually the dynasty would eventually decline and be supplanted by other powers in the region. But his name, however, would remain synonymous with the defense of the Muslim lands and the ideals of honor and nobility. And it still, as we shall see, inspires some modern states today. Saladin's life embodies the complexities of the medieval Middle East, marked by the shifting alliances and religious fervor and military conflict. His enduring legacy as a unifier of Muslim lands and a symbol of the resistance against foreign incursions continue to resonate with the collective memory of the people around the world. So that is the inspiring Saladin and the Ayyubid dynasty. So as for the content of the slide, so title we have Saladin and the Ayyubid dynasty. It was an Ayyubid Sultanate of Egypt. There's another title for it. It was a Sunni Muslim empire of Kurdish origin established following the abolition of the Shia Fatimid Caliphate. The significant leader we highlighted was Salah Adin Yusuf ibn Ayyub, Empire of the Ayyubid Dynasty, period 1171 to 1260 CE, which is the medieval period. Modern locations include Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, and Iraq. Million square kilometers is 2.0. Million square kilometers is 0.77, the equivalent. It must be noted that this uh, percent of the world is 1.48%. Once again, I always note that there's varying degrees of 1 million square kilometers is different than 1 million squares elsewhere. This excludes Antarctica, but these are very developed. Egypt, for example, are our earliest empires. So to rule over Egypt is much, perhaps, more difficult 
to have over to overthrow whomever might be incumbent at any period to rule over Egypt is certainly very difficult, whereas some other regions or some other empires have ruled over more developing regions, or perhaps may, one might be able to simply rule over them through a nomadic empire, whereas ruling over Egypt would perhaps perhaps maybe a more difficult region. But nonetheless, um, that's 1.48 percent of the world, all else being equal. Capital city was Cairo from 1,171 to 1,174 and 1,218 to 1,250 CE. As well, it was Damascus from 1,174 to 1,218. That's that intermediary period between the two periods in Cairo. And later, Aleppo from 1,250 to 1,260. And later, 1,260 to 1,341 after its sort of defeat. It sort of continued to exist for a period in Hama until 1,341 CE. The government was a sultanate, which was a princely confederation under the Abbasid Caliphate because they had to make a negotiation with them to, with, to overthrow the Fatimid Caliphate. But nonetheless, they were a principality and, and, or a sultanate and largely autonomous and were able to in, engage in their own military conquest, which might be one definition of being an empire, having that military autonomy. As for common languages, and I think at least throughout Saladin's whole life, he showed military autonomy. As for common languages, it was Arabic, which was a spoken language and in poetry. Kurdish was as well a pro predominant language because, for example, the ruling dynasty were of Kurdish descent. And Turkish as well was also a pro predominant language, a, or a, a prominent language. The religion was Sunni Islam, with the school was Shafi, and the creed was Ashari. Mil population was likely in the millions compare this but Abbasid was likely in the tens of millions so quite large but larger smaller than perhaps the population of the regions today because technology has changed and agriculture for example as for the images in the top left we have a a, a 19th century picture of a victorious Saladin by Gustave Doré see the this at least my depiction here is this guy's almost blinded or at least um, something mal to the head because of the such the glory that is Saladin in this individual too, and, um, just a glorious painting or drawing. I believe it's a drawing. It's a it's a sense of depiction here is my reference to it. This here, it, yes, it looks like a plain yellow square, but that is actually the banner of the Ayyubid dynasty. I actually love the color yellow. I believe it is in the middle of the electromagnetic spectrum. My brother and me have had a debate whether the green or yellow is in the middle of the electromagnetic spectrum. I believe it's yellow, but I might be wrong. But nonetheless, that is the um, the uh, the image or the standard, the, uh, the flag of the Ayyubid dynasty. As for the next to the right of that, we have the Saladin's personal standard, standard, which is the features the eagle, the which and this actually is a pic, a depiction based off the uh, Cairo citadel in Egypt. F furthermore, on the on the government of Egypt's coat of arms, there is also Saladin's eagle. It also exists, and furthermore, on the Kurdish regional government, they also feature Saladin's eagle. So that's showing the existence of Saladin's influence in two sta modern states. Oh, Kurds are technically not considered a country yet, but many people believe they should be a country, but they have a government, so in some ways they're... But nonetheless, they're inspired by Saladin, and as is Egypt today, on their coat of arms, respectively. Furthermore, to the... Uh, down and to the right, we have an Arabic trebuchet showing the complexity of their military uh, capacities at the time, and the complexities of the warfare that ultimately, for example, took Jerusalem. To uh, uh, up and to the right of that, we have the um, we have a painting of the a depiction of the conquering of Jerusalem. Here, I can the from the Oxford from Miss Hunt apparently from the Bolden Oxford Library is actually that's where the part of it that's where the trebuchet is found. I'm not certain where this painting is. From, but it's a quite beautiful one, and all rights are reserved. Uh, and below that, we have um, Frederick II signing a treaty with uh, restoring Jerusalem to the Crusaders for ten years. So showing somewhat the the nuances of the history of the Ayyubid Caliphate, in that sometimes they hold strong control over Jerusalem, but sometimes they had to make concessions to the Crusaders. So it wasn't like Saladin was ruling the whole time with a firm fist. Some of their leaders had to make concessions. Many even for a 10-year period gave up, for example, the 
Jerusalem. Uh, to the right of that, we have the uh, the Fidros Madrasa, showing some of the beautiful architecture, which means School of Paradise, and was created by Defa uh, by Defa Kutan, who was the princess of Aleppo. So Aleppo, and it, we can still see this uh, beautiful school here today, and we can see the architecture, which I believe is one of the epitomes of art. If actually, I don't believe it is a uh, all art is an epitome, but it can be an epitome of art. As for, it was preceded by, as mentioned, the Fatimid Caliphate. It was preceded also by the Zangrid dynasty, whom Saladin was working under, but then later formed his own dynasty. The Kingdom of Jerusalem as well, which they conquered. The, Zayu, the Zurayids, the Kingdom of Georgia, the Shar Armans, and the Ar Artikids. It was succeeded by the Mal Mamluk Sultanate, who rose from a slave rebellion. The Rasulid dynasty, the Emirate of Hasakaif. The Principality of Don Bro, the Emirate of Sirvan, the Emirate of Kilis, and the Emirate of Bingol. Actually, perhaps well, I was saying we, I, we had not seen an empire formed through a slave uh, revolt, but one could perhaps be said this about the, the history of the Jewish people, but they're not actually not included thus far on the list of largest empires because they have not nominally been called an empire before, but that was just a thought or perhaps a parallel. As we can, up in the top right, we have a map. So we have the Ayyubid Sultanate here. We can see the Abbasid Caliphate here, who they negotiated to find this territory. The Kievan Rus, an important empire we have covered. The Kuman Khanates here, the Sultanate of Rome. The Khwarzamian uh, Empire. The Kipchaks, the Karakitai, whom we've covered. The Gurids, whom we've covered. The Shia Shia, whom we've covered. Western Shia. The Tin Dynasty, whom we've covered. The Song Dynasty. The Goryeo, the Korean Empire, whom we will cover and have covered indirectly, and uh, Pagan and Khmer, so, so many important empires here, and we can kind of get an image or an idea for the time. As for the list of sultans, those are important ones Saladin, who is the first from 1174 to 1193, Al Aziz from 1193 to 1198, Al Mansur from 1198 to 1200, Al Adil, the first from 1200 to 1218, Al Kamil from 1218 to 1238, Al Adil, the, uh, the second from 1238 to 1240, Al S S uh, 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 deal the second 1238 to 1240 what uh, al kamil i pardon me i believe i missed 1218 to 1238 as sali ayub al 1240 to 1249 shajar al dur 1250 to 1250 for one year pardon me al ashraf from 1250 to 1254 so that is saladin and the ayubid dynasty and we will cover Ayyubid, uh, pardon me, Saladin more and perhaps the Ayyubid dynasty more in the comparison with Baldwin after covering him and the, uh, the Latin Empire. So this is a very, very fascinating empire as well, one w which I knew very little about. I heard about it in indirectly before, but it's sort of a unique period of history that I don't feel is properly covered or sufficiently covered. So the Latin Empire, perhaps because it was a short period, but a very important period to tie a lot of history together the medieval period of the high middle ages so the latin empire also known as the latin empire of constantinople was a short-lived crusader state established in the aftermath of the fourth crusade so we just covered some context of the third crusade now we're covering some context of the fourth crusade 1202 to 1204 was when the fourth crusades were it emerged as a result of the conquest of constantinople the capital of the byzantine empire by the Crusader army, so Constantinople was taken by one of these Byzantine, by, pardon me, by one of these Crusader armies. Therefore, we seek to find a history of its rise and fall. First, with some background information, so the Latin Empire, also referred to the, as the Latin Empire of Constantinople, was the was a feudal Crusader state founded by the leaders of the Fourth Crusade on the lands of the captured Byzantine Empire, as mentioned. The Latin Empire was intended to replace the Byzantine Empire as the Western recognized Roman Empire in the East, with the Catholic Empire enthroned in place of the Eastern Orthodox Roman Emperors. The main objective of the Latin Empire was planned by Venice, which promoted the creation of the, this state for their benefit. So it's got this connection to Venice 
and as we shall see on the map, it is well part of the empire is coming source its power from Venice as well. And this is maybe the first empire where we see Venice, which is sort of a very unique place geographically, exerting a strong political force. In fact, maybe even creating an empire. So, for background on causes of the Fourth Crusade in the late twelfth century starting with the Byzantine decline. So we've covered the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire. By the late 12th century, the Byzantine Empire had weakened by internal strife, external threats, and territorial losses to the Seljuk Turks and the rising powers of the Western, of Western Europe. As for a papal call for the Crusades, Pope Innocent III called for a new crusade to retake Jerusalem from Muslim control to aid the Byzantine Empire, which sought assistance against Turkish encroachments. So Pope Innocent III called for these crusades to come and take Jerusalem, which ultimately set these, all this momentum to beginning, and also to, to take from Muslim control and to aid the Byzantine Empire. So they also originally were coming for the purpose of aiding the Byzantine Empire. As for the, the diversion and the sack of Constantinople, however, the Fourth Crusade took an unexpected turn when a Venetian merchants diverted the Crusader army to attack Constantinople in 1203. So these Venetian no nobles convinced them to do otherwise and attack Constantinople, so contrary to their objective in 1203, to, seeking to settle their debts owed to the Byzantines. So these Venetians owed these debts to the Byzantines, so they called these uh, crusaders who were going to take Jerusalem instead to go and take Constantinople to service their own debts. So something that's often a common theme is that Venice rules through its, through its merchants and through its economy and through its debts. And it's very unique in that way. So thus as the rise of the Latin Empire after this period in 1204 CE. So th the siege and conquest of Constantinople, so in April, of 1204, the Crusader army, alongside Venetian forces, besieged and eventually captured Constantinople. The city was subjected to a brutal sack, resulting in a widespread destruction, looting, and loss of life. So a very, uh, much more gruesome establishment of an empire than that which we saw in the Ayyubid dynasty, or Saladin's coup, which was a bloodless conflict with the Fatimid Caliphate. So as for the establishment of the Latin Empire, so following the sack, the Crusades installed Baldwin of Flanders, so the important leader whom we will highlight, as the first Latin Emperor of Constantinople. The Latin Empire was proclaimed, and Baldwin I became its ruler, with Constantinople serving as its capital. So as we shall see, Baldwin came from Flanders, so he was originally on this journey to take Jerusalem, but instead he becomes comes to find his own emperor, empire, so very, very unique history. As for diversion of spoils, the, the territories of the Byzantine Empire were parti partitioned among the leaders of the Crusade and their Venetian allies. Various feudal states and fiefs were established, including the Duchy of Athens, the Kingdom of Thessalonica, and the Principality of Achaia. So quite a, a lot of plunder to be taken. So perhaps maybe it was an oversight thinking that these Crusaders who were coming to Jerusalem, who were perhaps inspired by ambition or in, inspired by glory would be um, would not be easily turned to a more perhaps even uh, alternative or equally maybe even more glorious pursuit of founding their own empire or maybe it would have been impossible for them to take Jerusalem so perhaps they took the easier route but nonetheless it was much different than what Pope Innocent III had expected. As for its challenges and declines starting from 1024 to 1061 CE starting with internal strife and instability the Latin Empire faced immediate challenges, including internal divisions among Crusader leaders, conflict over land and resources, and resistance from Greek Orthodox population who resented the Latin rule. So, they're ruling over these Greeks who had, cut, or the the Greeks who had been there for many years and been more like peoples historically, and these these Crusaders had marched through their territory and come to rule over them for for some for for no other reason but ambition it might seem. It evidently wouldn't be a religious reason because the religious causes were down in Jerusalem, which they were not addressing, perhaps. As for the, but nonetheless, Byzant Constantinople is a very religious city as well, so maybe at the time, maybe they did, maybe the religious purposes in Constantinople might have been greater than the call of Pope Innocent III in Jerusalem, but I believe otherwise. 
As for the Byzantine restoration efforts, despite the setbacks, remnants of the Byzantine Empire persisted in exi exile, particularly in the form of the Empire of Nicaea, or Nicaea, which was established in Asia Minor under the leadership of Theodore I Lascaris. So the Byzantine Empire still continues to exist under this Latin Empire, sort of in exile. The empire itself in exile. The Nicaean emperors, and as we shall see, it will continue to exist even after. So the history of our Byzantine Empire co covers over this period. Furthermore, the Nicaean emperors sought to reclaim Constantinople and restore Byzantine sovereignty. As for the Byzantine reconquest of Constantinople in 1261 CE, in 1261 CE, the Empire of Nicaea, under the rule of Michael the Eighth. Paleologos, a Greek name, launched a successful campaign to reconquer Constantinople, taking advantage of the internal strife and a weakened Latin Empire, and the Nicaean forces entered the city and expelled the Latin occupiers, restoring Byzantine control over their capital. So, sort of maybe the reason why the Byzantine Empire originally fell was the reason why they were able to take it back was the internal strifes. And it's almost like it's sort of a, a Odysseus coming back to reclaim their own territory, however, and they were also, in this case, Greek as well. But as for legacy and aftermath, at the end of the Latin Empire, the reconquest of Constantinople in 1261 marked the end of the Latin Empire. Baldwin II, the last Latin Empire, was captured and imprisoned. So, sort of parallelism, Baldwin I was the first, and Baldwin II was the last some uh, circuitousness um, forming as the last empire, emperor and he was captured and imprisoned by the Byzantines effectively ending the Latin rule in Constantinople so he was captured as for con the continued Byzantine fragmentation although Constantinople was reclaimed the Byzantine empire remained fragmented and weakened so it was still in its declining phases it would continue to struggle against external threats, including the Ottoman Turks, ultimately leading to the fall of Constantinople to the Ottomans in 1453, as we highlighted in the episode on the Byzantine Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire, and as we will highlight with the Ottoman Empire episode. As for the historical impact of the Latin Empire, so the Latin Empire left a lasting impact on the history of Byzantine Empire. Byzantine Empire and the Eastern Mediterranean. The Fourth Crusade and the sack of Constantinople strained the relations between the Latin West and the Greek East, contributing to cultural and religious divides that persisted for centuries. So perhaps maybe some still unreconciled differences between the regions and perhaps past traumas from this period. It was sort of a maybe a unfortunate occurrence through just wild ambition where some an individual from Flanders would be marching off for an ambitious pursuit, perhaps, maybe maybe it was entirely religious, but the fact that he changed seemed very much um, uh, quite a, a phenomenon of ambition, uh, for no, no other way to describe it. So as for a, a, a biography of Baldwin of the Latin Empire, so the Latin Empire of Constantinople established after the Fourth Crusade in 1204, had several rulers during its brief existence. Among them, Baldwin I of Flanders, also known as Baldwin the Ninth of Flanders, is often considered the most famous. So he's Baldwin the Ninth of Flanders, but the first of the Latin Empire. Therefore, we will seek to find a detailed biography of his life. So for some background information, so Baldwin I in Dutch, Baldwin in French, Baudwin, was born in July 1172, and died in circa 1205, makes him either a Cancer or a Leo, like myself. And he was the first emperor of the Latin emperor, Empire of Constantinople. He was also known as Count of Flanders, who began as a count, but would come to be an empire, emperor, so certainly rose in his, um, at least his titles, as Baldwin, born as Baldwin the Ninth, when he was, or at least that was his hereditary title, was Baldwin the Ninth of Flanders from 1194 to 1205, and Count of Hainaut as Baldwin the Sixth from 1195 to 1205, so of Hainaut, another region too, so still, he came from quite a privileged background, but nowhere near the level of an emperor, as we shall see. Baldwin was one of the most prominent leaders of the Fourth Crusade, so he was a significant leader and a very important 
commander as well, which resulted in the sack of Constantinople in 1204, diverted by the Venetians, the, or the people of Venice, which resulted in the sack of Constantinople in 1204, and the conquest of large parts of the Byzantine Empire and the foundation of the Latin Empire. He lost his final battle at Kaloyan the, to the Emperor of Bulgaria and spent the last days of his life as a prisoner, so as Baldwin II would later become a prisoner too. And this is the King of um, Bulgaria, this is the second Bulgarian Empire. So we've covered the first Bulgarian Empire. The second Bulgarian Empire actually is does not large enough to make it on the list of largest empires, so it was smaller than the Latin Empire itself, but we might highlight it directly depending on, uh, on how things play out. So as for his early life, Baldwin the first early life and background from 1172 to 1204 CE. So we'll start with his birth and heritage. Baldwin was born in 1162 in the county of Hainau, so he would come to rule over that region, which was part of the medieval county of Flanders, located in present-day Belgium. He belonged to the prominent House of Flanders, which played a significant role in the European politics in, during the High Middle Ages. Now Flanders Fields are there, a place of important visit where many brave Canadian soldiers are buried in other World War II um, soldiers. As for his upbringing and education, Baldwin received an education befitting of his noble status and courtly manners. As a member of the ruling family of Flanders, he was, he was also trained in uh, to some degree in military manners, but if anything, the highest degree of education befitting of a of a of a at least a, a duke as he would expect to become, but not perhaps of a king. Furthermore, as a member of the ruling family of Flanders, he would have been groomed for a life of leadership and governance too. So perhaps I expect to have at least some degree of political involvement. As for his military career, Baldwin embarked on a military career at a young age, participating in various military campaigns and battles across Europe. His experience on the battlefield would later prove invaluable during his reign as ruler of the Latin Empire, perhaps, though it's perhaps beyond his wild imagination at that time. As for his reign of, as Emperor of Constantinople in 1204 to 1205 CE, Sorry, with his accession to the throne. So following the capture of Constantinople in the Fourth Crusade, because he was a leader on his way to Jerusalem, in 1204, Baldwin was elected the first Latin Emperor of Constantinople. So elected, um, so non-hereditary monarchy, as we can see here. His leadership qualities and martial prowess earned him the support of the Crusader leaders, who saw him as a suitable candidate to rule the newly established Latin Empire. So. Maybe he was the greatest commander, or maybe he was the most befitting, probably a combination of both. Uh, or perhaps they feared him the most, but it seems, based on the image we will later see, it seems maybe he was maybe selected because of his wisdom, maybe more so than his military prowess. But that's speculation. As for challenges and consolidation, so Baldwin faced numerous challenges during his brief reign. He had to contend with the internal dissent, opposition from the Greek Orthodox population, and the constant threat of the Byzantine counterattack. So having formed this empire in the middle of Greek territory and facing constant Byzantine threats was not an easy place to form a new empire. Despite these challenges, Baldwin was worked to consolidate his rule and stabilize the Latin Empire. As for his expansionist ambitions, so certainly an ambitious figure, Baldwin sought to expand the territorial holdings of the Latin Empire to secure control over neighboring regions, including parts of Thrace and Asia Minor. However, his ambitions were hampered by fragmented nature by the fragmented nature of the realm and the reliance on the Byzantine resistance. As for his capture and imprisonment in 1205 CE, and his starting with defeat and capture. So Baldwin's reign as Latin Emperor came to an abrupt end in 1205 CE, when he suffered a major defeat at the Battle of Adrianopoli against the Bulgarian Tsar Kolyan, Kaloyan, um, of the Second Bulgarian Empire, which lasted from 1185 to 1396. The First Bulgarian Empire, which we have covered, is 1681 to 1018 CE. And Baldwin was captured during this battle and subsequently imprisoned by the Bulgarians. So, really, 
almost a Napoleonic figure long before. In fact, he sort of started as maybe somewhat of a noble family, but comes to become an emperor, but eventually is imprisoned. So sort of like an exile, maybe even worse. As for his imprisonment and fate, Baldwin spent the remaining years of his life in captivity, enduring harsh conditions and uncertain prospects. Despite efforts by his supporters to secure his release, Baldwin remained a prisoner of the Bulgarians until his death. So quite a, 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 tr a tragic way of, of going out, perhaps. Maybe it's better, it would have been more heroic for him to have died on the battlefield than to, to slowly. But I think, maybe if he, I think most people would like to live if they can, depending on the circumstances. I think if it were that bad, maybe he would have tried to have taken his own life, perhaps. So maybe he did want to live. As for his legacy and historical significance, the symbol of Latin rule of Constantinople. So Baldwin I of Flanders remains as a symbol of the Latin Empire's brief and tumultuous existence. His reign exemplifies the challenges faced by the crusaders in governing a foreign and hostile territory, as well as the complexities of medieval geopolitics in the eastern Mediterranean. As for his impact on the Byzantine history, Baldwin's capture and imprisonment marked a significant turning point in the history of the Latin Empire and the Byzantine Empire. His absence weak, weakened the Latin authority of Constantinople and provided an opportunity for Byzantine forces to regain his lost territories. So maybe he should have not been off fighting the Bulgarians and should have stayed on his own territories to maintain the empire, whereas he went and fought the Bulgarians and got imprisoned, which allowed for the Byzantine Empire to resurge, perhaps. His legacy continues, however, to be studied in the histories in Baldwin's life. Remains a, a reign as the first Latin Empire of Constantinople illustrates the dynamic and turbulent nature of medieval politics in the aftermath of the Fourth Crusade. His legacy continues to be studied by historians interested in the Crusades, Byzantine history, and the intersections between the East and the West during the Middle Ages. In fact, perhaps one of the most unique empires we've covered. And I think the Ayyubid dynasty as well is very unique. I think they're both a result of certainly unique sets of ambitions ambitions and unique sets of circumstances. So as for the content of the slide, so we have Baldwin and the Latin Empire. It was in, also known as Imperium Constantinopolitan, which is in Latin for Constantinople um, Empire. It was a feudal crusader state founded by leaders of the Fourth Crusade on the lands captured by the Byzant from the Byzantine Empire. Significant leader, we have Baldwin I of Flanders. Empire was the Latin Empire of Constantinople. The period was 1204 to 1261 CE, which is a medieval period, or the High Middle Ages, also much overlap in those periods. Modern locations are sometimes even considered synonymous. Modern locations include Turkey, Greece, and Bulgaria, and Venice as well, which is part of Italy, technically, now. Million square kilometers is 0.47, with million square kilometers, 0 0.19 percent of the world, 0 0.26. So not very large compared to many of the empires, less than half the size of our average empire, but significant in influence, significant in achievement. By uh, taking Constantinople, Constantinople for many times re ruled over huge, much much larger regions of land. So also going to percent of the world, 0 0.26. That includes Antarctica, very small, but it's a very sedentary and developed region of the world much easier much more difficult to conquer than many other regions or most other regions maybe all other regions at this time even but maybe uh, that might be an exaggeration but it is certainly one of the harder regions to to conquer so despite being small it's certainly uh, important worthy of note as for its capital was constantinople government was a feudal christian monarchy it's quite unique uh, blackstone says there's Elective monarchies and hereditary monarchies. This would fall under uh, elective, at least in the case of Baldwin. The first was elected. There were some hereditary ones, but it was elective, but also Christian too. So, as for common languages, where Latin, Old French was the official language because Baldwin the first came from France, Baldwin of uh, uh, Flanders, and Greek was also the popular region, religion because uh, popular language because that was the language of the region. The religions were Latin Catholic was the official religion because they came originally at the instruction of Pope the Third, um, Pope Innocent the Third, and Greek Orthodox was the popular religion because that was the religion of the people whom they were ruling over. 
population was hundreds of thousands to few millions, smaller than the population today, but larger than many of the empires we've covered so far. So despite the small, small region, large population. In terms of images, in the top left, we have emperor and autocrat of the Romans, Baldwin the I of Flanders. Same see as I got just by the images, I think if anything assume the image is right, it seems he's more wise than a threatening character. From my perspective of facial recognition. To the right of that we have the arms used by Philip of Courtney, which is the uh, the assigned coat of arms of the Latin Empire, but it wasn't actually the coat of arms used. But nonetheless, this was the coat of arms of Philip of Courtney, who held the title of Latin Empire of Constantinople from 1273 to 1283. So often when you see this, the coat of arms of the Latin Empire, you see this coat of arms from this Philip of Courtney, who was held the title of Latin Empire of Constantinople. But even though Constantinople at that time was reinstated to Byzantines in 1261, so it was no longer the Latin Empire at this time. The, the design was sometimes presented as the arms of the empires of Constantinople in early modern her heraldry. Uh, to the right of that, we have the seal of Philip of Courtney, which is, who was the Latin emperor in exile from 1273 to 1283. And on his title, it says, De Gratia Imperator Remenie a Semper Augustus. So by the grace of God, Emperor of Romania, ever God, as ever August. So August is Augusta. Um, the, the verb, or noun in this case, but nonetheless, Romania is different from Rome necessarily. So the, the region of Romania is different, as we can see, because below that, the Latin, we have a, the by the grace of God, we have a, by the grace of God, Emperor of Romania. Ever, oh, pardon me. Below that, we have the Latin Empire with its vassals in. Um, no, pardon me. This this here we have is the. The Baldwin the first seal, and it's ambiguous because it says only, um, it says only Rome, uh, Rome here, and it's ambiguous as to whether it's Romania, Romania, or Rome. So are they trying to connect themselves with more so the region, or are they connecting themselves more so with Pope Innocent the Third? Is ambiguous. But over time, as we can see in the last seal we have here, it's Romania. So at least over time, it's switched maybe more so from a Roman concept to a Romania concept, and therefore a Latin concept. As d d these two images, I was also not able to find the sources of those, so all rights reserved, but nonetheless beautiful images showing the Fourth Crusade, the sack of Constantinople by it, and the forming of the Latin Empire. Uh, I often like these depictions that look sort of playful-like, but they're depicting such uh, horrific scenes, in fact, however. So for important emperors, we have Baldwin the first emperor from 1204 to 1205, Henry from 1205 to 1216, Peter from 1216 to 1217, Yolanda from 1217 to 1219, Robert the first from 1221 to 1228, John from 1229 to 1237, and Baldwin the second from 1228 to 1261, who was the last, who was also imprisoned. Historical era was the High Middle Ages, often overlaps with the medieval period as well. Sack of Constantinople was in 1204. The joint Nisaean Bulgarian campaign against the empire was in 1235. So it was also the Nisaeans and the Bulgarians were threatening in on the Latin Empire. So it was perhaps through necessity that Baldwin had to fight them and got captured. But nonetheless, getting captured probably was not in the best interest of the Latin Empire. So maybe he should have stood a little further from the front lines, perhaps, and, and it was disestablished in 1261. It was preceded by the Byzantine Empire under the Angelos dynasty, and it was succeeded by the Byzantine under the Palaiologos Palaiologos dynasty. It was also succeeded by the Principality of Achaea, and the Duchy of Athens, and the Duchy of the Archipelago. As for the map, we can see all these regions so included in Venice, the Venetian territories, we have Emperor in Achaea, of uh, uh, Nicaea here, um, we have the Emperor Latin and uh, Despera de Pera, so, but nonetheless they ruled all, over all these colored regions we consider to be the Latin Empire, including their vassal states. So as for a comparison between the two great leaders, in my opinion Saladin and Baldwin, two very very fascinating and unique dynasties.
So Saladin of the Ayyubid dynasty and Baldwin the first of the Latin Empire. So Saladin of the Ayyubid dynasty and Baldwin the first of the Latin Empire were two prominent leaders who emerged during the tumultuous period of the Crusades in the medieval Middle East. And they both during the Crusades periods is one similarity for sure. While they hailed from opposing sides of the religious divide, Saladin a Muslim ruler and Baldwin the first a Christian crusader, they shared some similarities in their roles as military commanders and statesmen. Therefore, we seek to com both compare and contrast these two very important and inspiring leaders, at least to me. So, similarities. Their military leadership. Both Saladin and Baldwin I were renowned military leaders who demonstrated strategic acumen and battlefield prowess. They each achieved significant victories and played central roles in the conflict of their times. And both of them rose to the ranks through being military commanders for sort of different purposes. And then they both shifted and sort of at least took a purpose that was more aligned with their own rise to power. As for their diplomatic skill, despite their differences in religion and cultural background, both Saladin and Baldwin displayed diplomatic skill and statesmanship in their interactions with other powers. They negotiated treaties, alliances, and truces when necessary to further their goals and ensure the stability of their realms. Two examples off the top of my head, with the Ayyubid dynasty, they negotiated with the Abbasid Caliphate to have a bloodless coup to take over the territories from the Fatimid Caliphate. For the Latin Empire, it was the Venetians who perhaps convinced them to take over Constantinople instead of going for Jerusalem, so at least some sort of diplomacy there. As for their cultural and religious tolerance, despite their religious animosity of the Crusades, both leaders exhibited a degree of, despite the religious tolerance generally around the Crusades, both leaders exhibited a relative degree of tolerance towards people of different faiths. Saladin in particular was known for his magnanimity towards Christians and Jews in territories he controlled after he'd taken them, well, and even in the process of taking them, he was respectful in battle too. While Baldwin I faced the challenge of governing a diverse population com compromising Orthodox Christians, Catholics, and others in Constantinople. But maybe sort of the difference here is, at least within the Latin Empire, was within Christianity that they were. So Orthodox Greeks, for example, and Catholics were evidently quite different, and at least Baldwin was respectful of these different sects to control over them, whereas Saladin was respectful across religious religions from Islam to Christianity to Judaism, so perhaps a little bit broader in Saladin, but that does not mean in, in terms of absolute terms he was more tolerant. As for some of their differences, religious affiliations, as for my guess, the most obvious difference between Saladin and Baldwin I was their religious affiliation. Saladin was a devout Muslim ruler of the Ayyubid dynasty, while Baldwin I was a Christian crusader who became the first Latin emperor of Constantinople following the capture of the city during the Fourth Crusade. As for their cultural backgrounds, Saladin was a Kurdish origin and was deeply rooted in the cultural traditions of their Islamic world. In contrast, Baldwin I came from the House of Flanders, a prominent noble family in the medieval Europe and was steeped in cultural and political milieu of the Western Christendom. So they both came from, however, powerful families, but I think both of them were relative minorities in the empires through which they ruled. But sort of maybe the, at least their, their people, however, rule the tops because of perhaps their own rise. As for their, uh, furthermore, their geographical focus, Saladin's sphere of influence was primarily in the Levant and Egypt, where he sought to unify Muslim territories and repel crusader, crusader incursions. Baldwin I, as late, later Baldwin might have been, Baldwin I, on the other hand, focused on his efforts on the establishment and maintaining of the Latin Empire of Constantinople in the heart of Byzantine, the Byzantine Empire. But I think both of them led histories that they did not expect. I don't think either of them expected to rule their own empires. Maybe they both wanted it, but I think it was starting from their early Kurdish and early Flanders origins might have seemed unlikely for them to rule over Egypt and Constantinople, respectively. As for their legacy and historical impact, while both Saladin and Baldwin left the lasting legacies on the history and of the Crusades and the medieval Middle East, their impact differed in certain respects. Saladin is remembered as a symbol of unity and resistance in the Muslim world, revered for his chivalry and honor. 
Baldwin's legacy is more mixed, reflecting complexities of the Crusader rule in Constantinople and challenges of governing a diverse and contested territory. So maybe Saladin is seen a little bit more with magnanimity, whereas Baldwin is a bit more of the sort of the amb ambitious one and sort of maybe diverter of sort of original objectives, but nonetheless both ended up finding or founding their own empires. So thus, while Saladin and Baldwin shared certain qualities as military leaders and statesmen, their differences in religious affiliation, cultural backgrounds, and geographical focus shape both their respective roles and legacies in history as of the history of the Crusades and the medieval Middle East. So thank you very much for watching and or listening to this episode of Ages of Empires where we covered the Ayyubid dynasty and Saladin and the Latin Empire and Baldwin, two very, very fascinating empires in my opinion, and two very, very fascinating inspiring leaders. I hope I did not cast judgment on either empire or either leader. I was neither existent in during either empire or met either leader. I only have the details in front of me and I'm trying to sort of learn about them through their comparisons and that's sort of it, there's the quote from Anna Karenina that loosely quoted that all su successful families are alike and all unsuccessful families are different for different reasons. So why are these empires and leaders different? I hope that's how we can learn about what makes them unique. So nonetheless, thank you very much for watching this episode of Cashcroft TV. My name is Kayla Ashcroft, and I'd be very, very grateful if you continue to support. Thank you so much.